Hi, third and fourth graders. It's Miss Citrin here. Are you ready for our next installment of the BFG? When we left off, uh, the BFG had um, brought Sophie to London so that they can implement her plan to rid the world of the man-eating giants. And he's mixed up this dream with all the details that Sophie says should be in it to get the queen convinced that there that these uh, giants really exist. And now they are at the palace, and that's where we've left off. Uh, it ends with Sophie saying, we're there, we're in the queen's back garden. All right, so this next chapter is called The Palace. By gumdrops, whispered the big friendly giant. Is this really it? There's the palace, Sophie whispered back. Not more than a hundred yards away through the tall trees in the garden, across the mown lawns and the tidy flower beds, the massive shape of the palace itself loomed through the darkness. It was made of whitish stone. The sheer size of it staggered the BFG. But this place is having a hundred bedrooms at least, he said. Easily, I should think, Sophie whispered. Then I is Boggled, the BFG said. How is I possibly finding the one where the queen is sleeping? Let's go a bit closer and have a look, Sophie whispered. The BFG glided forward among the trees and suddenly he stopped dead. The great ear in which Sophie was sitting began to swivel around. Hey, Sophie whispered, you're going to tip me out. Shh, the BFG whispered back. I is hearing something. And he stopped behind a clump of bushes. He waited. The ear was still swinging this way and that. Sophie had to hang on tight to the side of it and save herself from tumbling out. The BFG pointed through a gap in the bushes and there, not more than 50 yards away, she saw a man padding softly across the lawn and he had a guard dog with him on a leash. The BFG stayed as still as a stone. So did Sophie. The man and the dog walked on and disappeared into the darkness. You was telling me they has no soldiers in the back garden, the BFG whispered. He wasn't a soldier, Sophie whispered. He was some sort of a watchman. We'll have to be careful. I is not too worried, the BFG said. These waxy big ears of mine is picking up even the noise of a man breathing the other side of this garden. How much longer before it gets light, Sophie whispered. Very short, the BFG said. We must go pell-mell for leather now. And he glided forward through the vast garden, and once again Sophie noticed how he seemed to melt into the shadows wherever he went. His feet made no sound at all, even when he was walking on gravel. Suddenly, they were right up close against the back wall of the great palace. The BFG's head was level with the upper windows one flight up, and Sophie, sitting in his ear, had the same view. In all the windows on that floor, the curtains seemed to be drawn. There was no light coming from anywhere. And in the distance, they could hear the muted sound of traffic going around Hyde Park Corner. The BFG stopped and put his other ear, the one Sophie wasn't sitting in, close to the first window. No, he whispered. What are you listening for? Sophie whispered back. For breathing, the BFG whispered. I is able to tell if it is a man, human being, or a lady by the breathing voice. We has a man in there, snortling, snortling a little bit, too. And he glided on, flattening his tall, thin, black cloaked body against the side of the building. He came to the next window. He listened. No, he whispered, and he moved on. This room is empty, he whispered. He listened in at several more windows, but at each one he shook his head and moved on. When he came to the window in the very center of the palace, he listened, but did not move on. Ho, oh, ho, he whispered. We has a lady sleeping in there. Sophie felt a little quiver go running down her spine. But who, she whispered back. The BFG put a finger to his lips for silence. He reached up through the window and parted the curtains ever so slightly. The orange glow from the night sky over London crept into the room and cast a glimmer of light onto its walls. It was a large room, a lovely room, a rich carpet, gilded chairs, a dressing table, a bed, and on the pillow of the bed lay the head of a sleeping woman. Sophie suddenly found herself looking at the face she had seen on stamps and coins and in newspapers all her life. For a few seconds, she was speechless. Is that her? The BFG whispered. Yes, Sophie whispered back. 
The BFG wasted no time. First, and very carefully, he started to raise the lower half of the large window. The BFG was an expert on windows. He had opened thousands of them over the years to blow his dreams into children's bedrooms. Some windows got stuck, some were wobbly, some creaked, and he was pleased to find that the queen's window slid upwards like silk. He pushed up the lower half as far as it would go so as to leave a place on the sill for Sophie to sit. Next, he closed the crack in the curtains. Then, with finger and thumb, he lifted Sophie out of his ear and placed her on the window ledge with her legs dangling just inside the room but behind the curtains. Now, don't you go tip-toppling backwards, the BFG whispered. You must always be holding on tight with both hands to the inside of the window sill. Sophie did as he said. It was summertime in London and the night was not cold, but don't forget that Sophie was wearing only her thin nighty. She would have given anything for a dressing gown, not just to keep her warm, but to hide the whiteness of her nighty and watchful eyes uh, and from watchful eyes in the garden below. The BFG was taking the glass jar from the pocket of his cloak. He unscrewed the lid and now very cautiously he poured the precious stream into the wide end of, of his trumpet, and he steered the trumpet through the curtains far into the room, aiming it at a place where he knew the bed to be. And he took a deep breath. <gasps> he puffed out his cheeks and poof, he blew. And here's a picture, it's a, one of the great pictures in the book, of the BFG blowing the dream in through the queen's window and Sophie sitting on the ledge. There's a, a closer up of her sitting on the ledge there. Now he was withdrawing the trumpet, sliding it out very carefully like a thermometer. Is you all right sitting there, he whispered. Yes, Sophie murmured. She was quite terrified, but determined not to show it. She looked down over her shoulder. The ground seemed miles away. It was a nasty drop. How long will the dream take to work, Sophie whispered. Some takes an hour, the BFG whispered back. Some is quicker, some is slower still, but it is sure to find her in the end. Sophie said nothing. I is going off to wait in the garden, the BFG whispered. When you is wanting me, just call out my name and I is coming very quick. Will you hear me, Sophie whispered. You is forgetting these, the BFG whispered, smiling and pointing to his great ears. Goodbye, Sophie whispered, and suddenly, unexpectedly, the BFG leaned forward and kissed her gently on the cheek. Sophie felt like crying. When she turned to look at him, he was already gone. He had simply melted away into the dark garden. Now, here comes another great chapter in the book. It's called The Queen. And this is when the queen gets the dream and how she realizes that it's true. Dawn came at last, and the rim of the lemon-colored sun rose up behind the rooftops where, somewhere behind Victoria Station. A while later, Sophie felt a little of its warmth on her back and was grateful, and in the distance she heard a church clock striking. She counted the strikes. There were seven. She found it almost impossible to believe that she, Sophie, a little orphan of no real importance in the world, was at this moment actually sitting high above the ground on the windowsill, of the Queen of England's bedroom, with the Queen herself asleep in there behind the curtain, not more than five yards away. The very idea of it was absurd. No one had ever done such a thing before. It was a terrifying thing to be doing. What would happen if the dream didn't work? No one, least of all the Queen, would believe a word of her story. It seemed possible that nobody had ever woken up to find a small child sitting behind the curtains on his or her windowsill. The Queen was bound to get a shock. Who wouldn't? With all the patience of a small girl who was something um, who has something important to wait for, Sophie sat motionless on the windowsill. How much longer, she wondered. What time do queens wake up? Faint stirrings and distant sounds came to her from deep inside the belly of the palace. Then, all at once, beyond the curtains, she heard the voice of the sleeper in the bedroom. It was a slightly blurred sleep talker's voice. Oh, no, it cried out. No, don't. Someone stop them. Don't let them do it. I can't bear it. Oh, please stop them. It's horrible. Oh, it's ghastly. No, no, no. She is having the dream, Sophie told herself. It must be really horrid. I feel so sorry for her. But 
It has to be done. And after that, there were a few moans, but there was a long silence. Sophie waited. She looked over her shoulder. She was terrified that she would see the man with the dog down in the garden staring up at her. But the garden was deserted. A pale summer mist hung over it like smoke. It was an enormous garden, very beautiful, with a large, funny-shaped lake at the far end. There was an island in the lake, and there were ducks swimming in the water. And inside the room, beyond the curtain, Sophie suddenly heard what was obviously a knock on the door. She heard the doorknob being turned. She heard someone entering the room. Good morning, your majesty, a woman was saying. It was the voice of an oldish person. There was a pause, and then a slight rattle of china and silver. Will you have your tray on the bed, ma'am, or on the table? Oh, Mary, something awful has just happened. And this was a voice Sophie had heard many times on radio and television, especially on Christmas Day. It was a very well-known voice. Now, every English child would recognize the Queen's voice because she addresses the whole nation on Christmas Day. And the royal people have been doing that for a very long time. Well, whatever is it, ma'am? I just had the most frightful dream. It was a nightmare. It was awful. Oh, I am sorry, ma'am, but don't be distressed. You're awake now and it will go away. It was only a dream, ma'am. Do you know what I dreamed, Mary? I dreamed that girls and boys were being snatched out of their beds at boarding schools and were being eaten by the most ghastly giants. The giants were putting their arms in through the dormitory windows and plucking the children out with their fingers, one lot from a girl's school and another from a boy's school. It, it was all so, so vivid, Mary. It was so real. There was a silence. Sophie waited. She was quivering with excitement. But why the silence? Why didn't the other one, the maid, why didn't she say something? Well, what on earth the matter, Mary? The famous voice was saying. There was silence again. Mary, you've gone white as a sheet. Are you feeling ill? There was suddenly a crash and a clatter of crockery, which could only have meant that the tray the maid was carrying had fallen out of her hands. Mary, the famous voice was saying rather sharply, I think you'd better sit down at once. You look as though you're going to faint. You really mustn't take it so hard just because I've had an awful dream. Oh, oh that, that isn't the reason, ma'am. The maid's voice was quivering terribly. Then for heaven's sake, what is the reason? Oh, I am very sorry about the tray, ma'am. Oh, don't worry about the tray. But what on earth was it that made you drop it? Why did you go white as a ghost all of a sudden? You haven't seen the papers yet, have you, ma'am? No. What do they say? Sophie heard the rustling of a newspaper as it was being handed over. It's like the very dream you had in the night, ma'am. Oh, rubbish, Mary. Where is it? On the front page, ma'am. It's the big headlines. Great Scott, cried the famous voice. Eighteen girls vanished mysteriously from their beds at Rodan School. Fourteen boys disappear from Eton. Bones are found underneath the dormitory windows. Then there was a pause punctuated by gasps from the famous voice as the newspaper article was clearly being read and digested. Oh, how ghastly, the famous voice cried out. It's absolutely frightful. Bones under the windows. What can have happened? Oh, those poor children. But, ma'am, don't you see, ma'am? See what, Mary? Those children were taken away almost exactly as you dreamed it, ma'am. Oh, not by giants, Mary. No, ma'am, but the bit about the girls and the boys disappearing from their dormitories, you dreamed it so clearly, and then it actually happened. That's why I came over all queer, ma'am. I'm coming over a bit queer myself, Mary. It gives me the shakes, ma'am, when something like that happens. It really does. I don't blame you, Mary. I shall get you more breakfast, ma'am, and have this mess cleared up. No, no, don't go. Mary, stay here a moment. And Sophie wished that she could see the room, but she didn't dare touch the curtains. The famous voice began speaking again. I really did dream about those children, Mary. It was clear as crystal. I know you did, ma'am. I don't know how giants get into it, but that was rubbish. Shall I draw the curtains, ma'am? Then we shall all feel better. It's a lovely day. And here's a picture of the queen in bed reading the newspaper with the story of the English children being eaten taken from their beds. And now the maid's going over to the window and she's going to open 
the curtains. Oh, please do, the queen said. With a swish, the great curtains were pulled aside. The main screen screamed, <gasps> Sophie froze to the window ledge. And here is the picture of the maid opening the curtains. And you can see Sophie sitting there. Well, she is shocked. The queen, sitting up in her bed with the times on her lap, glanced up sharply. Now it was her turn to freeze. She didn't scream, as the maid had done. Queens are too self-controlled for that. She simply sat there staring wide-eyed and white-faced at the small girl who was perched on her windowsill in her nightie. Sophie was petrified. Curiously enough, the queen looked petrified, too. One would have expected her to look surprised, as you or I would have looked, had we discovered a small girl sitting on our windowsill first thing in the morning. But the queen didn't look surprised. She looked genuinely frightened. The maid, the, a middle-aged woman with a funny cap on the top of her head, was the first to recover. What in the name of heaven do you think you're doing in here? She shouted angrily to Sophie. Sophie looked beseechingly toward the queen for help. The queen was still staring at Sophie. Gaping at her would be more accurate. Her mouth was slightly open. Her eyes were round and wide as two saucers, and the whole of that rather lovely face was filled with disbelief. Now listen here, young lady. How on earth did you get into this room? The maid shouted furiously. I don't believe it, the queen was murmuring. I simply don't believe it. I'll take her out of here at once, ma'am, the maid was saying. No, Mary, no, no, uh, don't do that. The queen spoke so sharply that the maid was quite taken aback. She turned and stared at the queen. What on earth had come over Her Majesty? It looked as though she was in a state of shock. Are you all right, ma'am, the maid was saying. When the queen spoke again, it was in a strange, strangled sort of whisper. Tell me, Mary, she said, tell me quite truthfully, is there really a little girl sitting on my windowsill, or am I still dreaming it? She is sitting there, all right, ma'am, as clear as daylight, but heaven only knows how she got there. Your majesty is certainly not dreaming at this time. But that's exactly what I did dream, the queen cried out. I dreamed that as well. I dreamed that there would be a little girl sitting on my windowsill in her nightie, and she would talk to me. The maid, with, the maid, with her hands clasped across her starched white bosom, was staring at her mistress with a look of absolute disbelief on her face. The situation was getting beyond her. She was lost. She had not been trained to cope with this kind of madness. Are you real? The queen spoke to Sophie. Yes, your majesty, Sophie murmured. What is your name? Sophie, your majesty. And how did you get up on my window so No, no, don't answer that. Hang on a moment. I dreamed that part of it, too. I dreamed that a giant put you there. He did, your majesty, Sophie said. The maid gave a howl of anguish and clasped her hands over her face. Control yourself, Mary, the queen said sharply. And then to Sophie, she said, you are not serious about the giant, are you? Oh, yes, your majesty. He's out there in the garden now. Is he indeed, the queen said. The sheer absurdity of it all was helping her to regain her composure. So he's in the garden, is he? She said, smiling a little. Oh, he is a good giant, your majesty, Sophie said. You will need not be frightened of him. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it, said the queen, still smiling. He is my best friend, your majesty. Oh, how nice, the queen said. He is a lovely giant, your majesty. Oh, I'm quite sure he is, the queen said. But why have you and this giant come to see me? I think you have dreamed that part too, your majesty, Sophie said calmly. That pulled the queen up short. It took the smile right off her face. She certainly had dreamed that part of it. She was remembering now how in the end of the dream, it had said that a little girl and a big friendly giant would come and show her how to find the nine horrible man-eating giants. But be careful, the queen told herself. Keep very calm, because this is surely not very far from the place where madness begins. You did dream that, didn't you, your majesty, Sophie said. The maid was out of it now. She just stood there goggling. Yes, the queen murmured. Yes, now you come to mention it, I did. But how do you know what I dreamed? Oh, that's a long story, your majesty, Sophie said. Would you like me to call the big friendly giant? The queen looked at the child. The child looked straight back at the queen. 
her face open and quite serious. The queen simply didn't know what to make of it. Is someone pulling my leg, she wondered. Shall I call him for you, Sophie went on. You'll like him very much. The queen took a deep breath. She was glad no one except her faithful old Mary was here to see what was going on. Very well, she said. You may call your giant. No, wait a moment. Mary, pull yourself together and give me my dressing gown and slippers. The maid did as she was told. The queen got out of bed and put on a pale pink dressing gown and slippers. You may call him now, the queen said. And Sophie turned her head toward the garden and called out, BFG, Her Majesty the Queen would like to see you. The queen crossed over to the window and stood beside Sophie. Come down off that ledge, she said. You're going to fall backwards any moment. Sophie jumped down into the room and stood there beside the queen at the open window. Mary the maid stood behind them. Her hands were planted firmly on her hips, and there was a look on her face that seemed to say, I want no part in this fiasco. I don't see any giant, the queen said. Please wait, Sophie said. Shall I take her away now, ma'am, the maid said. Take her downstairs and give her some breakfast, the queen said. And just then there was a rustle in the bushes beside the lake. Then out he came, 24 feet tall, wearing his black cloak and the grace of a nobleman. Still carrying his long trumpet in one hand, he strode magnificently across the palace lawn toward the window. The maid screamed, the queen gasped, <gasps> and Sophie, she waved. The BFG took his time. He was very dignified in his approach. And when he was close to the window where the three of them were standing, he stopped and made a slow, graceful bow. His head, after he had straightened up again, was almost exactly level with the watchers at the window. Your Majesty, he said, I is your humbug servant. And he bowed again. And there is a picture of the BFG coming to the Queen's window. Considering she was meeting a giant for the very first time in her life, the Queen remained astonishingly, astonishingly self-composed. We are very pleased to meet you, she said. And down below, a gardener was coming across the lawn with a wheelbarrow. He caught sight of the BFG's legs over to his left. His gaze traveled slowly upwards along the entire height of the enormous body. He gripped the handles of the wheelbarrow. He swayed, he tottered, then he keeled over on the grass in a dead faint. Nobody noticed him. Oh, Magister, cried the BFG. Oh, Queen, oh, Moniker, oh, Golden Sovereign, oh, Ruler, oh, Ruler of Straight Lines, oh, Sultana, I is come here with my little friend Sophie to give you a, to give you, and the BFG hesitated, searching for the word. To give me a what? the Queen asked. Ah, assistance, the BFG said, beaming. The Queen looked puzzled. He sometimes speaks a bit funny, your Majesty, Sophie said. He never went to school. Well, then he must go to school. We must send him, the Queen said. We have some very good schools in this country. I has a great I has great secrets to tell your majesty, the BFG said. Oh, I should be delighted to hear them, the queen said, but not in my dressing gown. Shall you wish to get dressed, ma'am, the maid said. Have either of you had breakfast, the queen said. Oh, could we, Sophie cried. Oh, please, I haven't eaten a thing since yesterday. I was about to have mine, the queen said, but Mary dropped it. The maid gulped. I imagine we have more food in the palace, the queen said, speaking to the BFG. Perhaps you and your little friend would care to join me? Will it be repulsant snaz cumbers, Magister, the BFG asked. Will it be what, the Queen said. Stinky snaz cumbers, the BFG said. What is he talking about? It sounds like a rude word to me. And she turned to the maid and said, Mary, ask them to serve breakfast for three in, in the, uh, I think it better be the ballroom. That has the highest ceiling. And to the BFG said, I'm afraid you will have to go through the door on your hands and knees, and I shall send someone to show you the way. The BFG reached up and lifted Sophie out of the window. You is I, you and I is leaving her majesty alone to get dressed, he said. No, no, leave the little girl here with me, the queen said. We'll have to find something for her to put on. She can't have breakfast in her nighty. The BFG returned Sophie to the bedroom. Can we have sausages, your majesty, Sophie said, and bacon and fried eggs? Oh, I think that might be managed, the queen answered, smiling. Just wait till you taste it, Sophie said to the BFG. No more snaz cumbers from now on. And look at this wonderful picture of the BFG and the Queen and Sophie chatting through the window of the Queen's bedroom. All right, we have time. Do we have time for one more chapter? No, I think we're going to have to stop here. 
But um, the next chapter is very, very funny. It's called The Royal Breakfast, and it's how the BFG is fed breakfast and what goes on there. You'll love it. It's very, very good. You're going to meet a, a funny character. The head butler, Mr. Tibbs, is very, very funny. Just keep the word glide in mind. All right, till next time. Bye-bye.